first of all, thank you very much for being here with us. Um, I'm very pleased and honored actually to have been invited by Irina Bareliuk. Uh, I'd like to thank her uh, for putting together this panel. Uh, the title is Quantification Will Tear Us Apart and it's going to be a conversation kick-off and uh, led by uh, Manuel Beltran, an artist. He will present himself and his project and some provocation and some ideas. And uh, Katarzyna Shimelevich. Katarzyna Shimelevich, that's exactly correct. Perfect, quite. Um, from uh, Panopticon. Panopticon Foundation, and also European Digital Rights. If somebody knows Adrian Brussels, I'm also part of this network will respond and I have the pleasure also to participate in the conversation. But uh, uh, the rules are the following. We'll start with a 25, 30 minutes presentation by Manuel and uh, we will follow with the 10, 15 minutes maximum from each of us and we'll try to turn into a conversation with the entire public. I know you are so many, but you have a lot of questions. I already feel it, so we will bring you a speaker. Manuel, the Thank floor you. is your can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, well, as Rocco already has introduced the, um, what we are here for, I'm, I just had a few concepts that we will be trying to, to deal with, such as optimization, the promises that surveillance capital uh, imposes on us, um, metaphors that we can use to, to refer, to name, or to to try to work with surveillance capitalism, models of exploitation and the position of agency that it gives, um, what kind of agencies these metaphors give to us. Um, in 2015, I founded the Institute of Human Obsolescence. Um, it's an organization through which I work with many other people from fields such as economic or data government, as some of my colleagues are here, um, but also with other artists or scientists, people from healthcare. Um, this is the first installation, um, Biological Labor, in which we were trying to explore the future of work um, in a society in which the role of humans will, might no longer uh, require to perform manual or intellectual labor. So we use this bodysuit that you see in the image that captures the residual body heat of a human to transform it into electricity and then this electricity powers a small microcomputer that is mining cryptocurrency. So basically we were extracting the body heat of these biological bodies to produce cryptocurrency. That in, in the context of this talk, um, it's maybe interesting to think in the idea of optimization. There is no possibility of optimizing your labor in this project. You cannot make your body warmer or you would make it warmer the amount of electricity that fits in the computer will always be the same. Your computer will not run faster if um, you feed more electricity to it. So we were hiring them through a contract in which they were being hired for one, two, or three hours, and they were receiving the 80% of the production of cryptocurrency, and the institute was receiving the remaining 20%. And what is interesting is to, to analyze what controls the dynamics of production in this case, because as these humans couldn't improve their labor, they cannot do it worse, they cannot do it better, but it's the market forces who are dictating um, the value of their labor. So a worker might start working at the first point in the graph, producing this amount of value, but at the end of the working shift, might be producing more or less independently of, the, of their performance. So it's a condition in which the possibility of improvement, of optimization, was completely curtailed. Um, this is a new series of work called Data Production Labor, and I will speak about um, three of them. The three of them propose the imaginary of seeing ourselves not as users of platforms or services, but as data workers who are producing data for these companies. In this first installation, the participants are invited to scroll through their Facebook timeline and two camera components are recording both the facial responses and what is being seen in the phone at this moment. This runs under the promise of the optimization of the social. Facebook can be named as a, or, or imposes the imaginary that is a tool with which you can improve your, your social. And as a consequence of this promise, 
what is happening is the exploitation of capital emerging from the behavior that we have while using Facebook. This is a patent of Facebook in which they are already looking into how to look at the facial responses that you are giving while looking at a particular content of post to create uh, economies of prediction, economies that can predict behavior. The second installation um, is about the, the Google CAPTCHA systems. I'm sure you all have encountered them in a website in which you have to click, okay, this is a tree, this is a car, this is a jihadi, this is a rocket, or whatever. This is presented to us with the promise of security. This is a way to protect the web, to make the web safer, and so on. Um, but after this working shift, the installation gives you a receipt that reveals how the data being produced by filling these images has been fed into image recognition systems that Google secretly sold to the US Department of Defense to be used uh, as image recognition systems for the drone program. So this seemingly innocuous idea of security that Google CAPTCHA uh, imposes on us is then being reappropriated for military purposes. So the economic logic of surveillance capitalism also develops military infrastructure, such as you might know through, through Project Maven. After pressure of the workers, finally, Google say that they will not renew their contract, but this is one example of many others that might be occurring or might occur in the future. Um, data production labor three is about the promise of convenience, and it's a modified um, Amazon Alexa, a voice assistant, in which you can have a different interaction with her or with it, in which it actually explains the, the economic model behind of these interactions and how under this premise of how convenient it is to use one of these voice assistants, there are huge um, flows and, and new supply lines of extraction of capital, particularly, and this is another patent of Amazon, economies not just of prediction, but of behavioral modification. So this patent basically is explaining how this person is coughing, is a bit sick while speaking with the voice assistant, and Alexa is able to recognize that and to then to try to give a nudge to modify the behavior of this person in order to order pills for the coffin. We have many other examples such as Pokemon Go, in which um, the players of Pokemon Go will get directed to certain places to find certain Pokemons with which Niantic had commercial agreements of what they call um, sponsored um, places. Um, so in, in a first stage, I think there has been a lot of discussion of these systems of prediction economies, of how surveillance capitalism can create new products of prediction, but more and more we are diving into products that modify behavior. So a bit to recapitulate, these three installations tackle three promises. The promise of optimization of the social, in the case of Facebook, the promise of optimization of security, in the case of Google CAPTCHA, and the promise of optimization or convenience, in the case of um, Amazon Alexa. But what these promises that are imposed by surveillance capital provoking us is new supply lines through which to supply data to be exploited for different purposes, such as economic purposes, economies of big data, in the case of Facebook, but also military, as in the case with Google and Project Maven, and in the case of Amazon Alexa, the production of prediction products and the production of behavioral modification products. And of course, the second part of, of what actually happens in the exploitation of this data, this is not part of the promise or of the narrative. The, these narratives are most of the time attempted to be obfuscated, hidden, or, or neglected. And now we come a bit to what was the, the starting point of quantification will tear us apart. That is the qu contemporary quantified condition as a working title. And, and I have this quote from Capitalist Realism. It's a book by the late Mark Fisher, in which he's starting to, um, he's trying to analyze a condition of the youth in Britain and, and trying to analyze the, 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 massive, the massive spread of depression amongst young people um, from the perspective of the pursuit of pleasure. And he says, depression is usually characterized as a state of anhedonia, 
but the condition I'm referring to is constituted not by an inability to get pleasure so much as it is by an inability to do anything else than pursue pleasure. If we just change the wording here from pleasure to optimization, all of these tools that we carry in our pockets and are in our house, in a way, are tools to optimize our behavior that do not really reach a point of satisfaction in which we say enough, but is applying a, a systemic pressure to always improve, to always optimize, to always improve our numbers, to get more followers, to work more steps in Fitbit. If someone gets depressed because of that, we tend to frame it as a fault of the individual. A therapist will tell you, okay, this is your own problem, you have to buy new shoes, you have to get a new boyfriend, you have to change something within yourself. Now, a quote from The Age of Surveillance Capitalism that some of you might have seen the presentation of Susanna. If industrial civilization flourished at the expense of nature and now threats to cost us the earth, an information civilization shaped by surveillance capitalism will thrive at the expense of human nature and threatens to cost us our humanity. What I find really interesting of this last part is that she is not framing the individual as ultimate responsible for this condition, but is framing a civilization shaped by surveillance capitalism. So is bringing this structural dynamic of a collective problem in which if I am depressed, it might not be a, a thing within myself, but a thing about the system oppressing me. And I think th this is maybe as a starting point for, for the two of you, I'm very curious what you can elaborate further in this quantification will tear us apart and, and the framing of Fisher and Zuboff in the individual or the, the structural problem. Um, I'm getting towards the end. So Zuboff, I've been quite obsessed with her book, <laughs> reading it the last days. Um, as I said before, I'm using this metaphor of we as the data workers, we as the producers of data. Within the, the economic analysis of Zuboff, she speaks that human behavior is a raw material that is there. It's extracted through supply lines and then that is being rendered into data. So they can produce prediction products, behavioral modifications, and so on. But she does not refer to any intentionality of us producing the data or us as being the workers. But this framing, it just places us in the position of something is being extracted from us that otherwise will be still be there. That is our behavior. So from this framework, we perhaps have to rethink what do we mean by data workers and what do we mean by work? And perhaps it's not so much as in the sense of being an economic analysis of surveillance capitalism, but in the sense of a worker as an active agent of political life in society. A worker that is not just a user without much agency, but is a political agent that can organize labor, that can organize unions and so on. And perhaps the data worker is actually a subjugation condition that we must strive to escape and stop being data workers. So we are working now towards the organization of a data workers union. We will be hosting a large conference in Hamburg at, in September. And, and we like to think about it as the data workers union as the opportunity to create a collective shared imaginary in which we are not longer an individual user, but rather we are part of a larger collective that is we as the data workers, we as all of us that are subject um, to these conditions that surveillance capitalism is enforcing in us. And with that, I leave it there for my colleagues. Thank you very much, Manuel. Want me to comment first? Please. <laughs> yeah. Well, in fact, we we you know, we imagine this conversation as a free free flowing conversation. So I, I don't have any structured um, a monologue here. I would rather invite everybody to to be together with us in this conversation. Um, yeah, I will not be showing it, but um, maybe some of you uh, saw it uh, in recent days. I showed this this uh, in a yesterday panel. 
and I published this in, in a short essay that is published in Quartz, my, my own metaphor for profiling as I see it today, that uh, um, we as humans are subjected to profiling that results in, uh, in our digital profiles becoming uh, what I see as layered structures. Uh, this is my way of contesting this, um, this response that we often get as uh, digital rights advocates. Well, after all, people are responsible because they feed data into those ecosystems, yes, as if we were in control uh, of, yeah, like both engaging in, in, in certain economic activity, but also choosing the data we provide for this system. I think, actually, I would argue we, it's neither nor, like, neither we control the data we feed into the systems, nor we control economic activity uh, happening there and the real um, objectives or goals uh, pursued with our data, right? Like what type of um, uh, efficiency paradigm or what type of economic paradigm is pursued with our data. So we are in a really uh, crappy position. And uh, the metaphor I'm using with, 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 with layers of the profile is there to help people grasp how little can we control talking about uh, our own data, yes? The, the data we provide is just the core of this onion. And the second layer I imagine is uh, what I call behavioral analysis or results of behavior analysis where our observation of our bodies, of processes, including our biochemical processes if somebody uh, allows this technology to come closer, but even if we don't allow sensors, uh, we are uh, definitely monitored in our online behavior, which produces a lot of data um, showing uh, routines, interactions, uh, our psychological features, our mental states, uh, our mood, our uh, tendency to ignore or react, uh, speed, right, uh, efficiency of typing, and all those features that tell a certain story. And then the, 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 the third layer, uh, probably the most interesting for, for, for me as, as, as lawyer and, uh, and uh, activist, because that's hidden and that's really nasty, is the level of interpretation. So how this behavior is interpreted by machines uh, to create certain categories or concepts about this human being, right? Am I poor or wealthy? Am I lazy or working hard? Am I female or male or something in between? Am I a parent or, um, you know, a, a, a date, uh, dating, um, <laughs> somebody who is likely to engage in dating, whatever. So all those marketing categories, some of them quite innocent, some of them quite intrusive, like those related to our sexual life, health, um, um, psychometrics uh, or, or, or politics, uh, they are, in fact, in the third layer of interpretation by algorithms that we completely do not control. And, and I know what I'm saying because I spend a lot of time requesting data from various companies trying to uh, check, verify those marketing profiles. And I will not surprise you by saying that nobody ever revealed this to me. And if you go to Facebook website uh, to check your profile on Facebook, it's a joke, right? It's, it's, it's showing you your likes or something that you are likely to like on the basis of other likes, but it's, 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 it's very innocent uh, and very little data. Uh, so the point I'm making here is that in fact, as, as data producers, uh, I would say, yes, we are the raw material here rather than producer because we are not as active as I would expect a producer to be. And we are not at all in control of the real production process, which is controlled by those algorithms treated as uh, obviously a, a business, a business secrets. Uh, this morning we had an interesting panel on data ownership asking this question, who owns the data? Uh, that is inferred, who owns the data that is produced by algorithms. Of course, under GDPR, in theory that I endorse and, and, and support, we control them because this is also our personal data. But uh, in practice, it's extremely difficult to document that third layer of interpretation and get our hands on it, uh, at least for a reason that is very often used by companies, that it doesn't really exist. It's not really tangible. It's something that um, happens in milliseconds, something that is not uh, harvested in databases. Those marketing profiles, for example, they are not apparently lasting uh, more than a couple of moments, and yet they are used to inform decisions affecting our lives, yes? They are used to inform decisions uh, like what advertising to show to somebody, which might result in certain 
um, uh, I, I really love your terms, the way you put it, you know, the whole uh, market of prediction or those, those products modifying behavior. Uh, advertising also is such a product, right? Meant to modify my behavior. So if this has impact on me, and if that thing was produced on the basis of my behavior, and yet I'm not able to even see it, uh, even less control, who am I in this, in this data processing machine? I would say we are this raw resource being exploited. And um, how to change that uh, position of power? Of course, as a lawyer, I'm still quite hopeful about using regulations like GDPR, but it's a very long fight, which uh, uh, certainly will take uh, years uh, to, 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 to execute, yes, against companies like, like those big, big players. Uh, so maybe another way of approaching this would be to somehow encourage more transparency from those companies in their own market logic. It's a dangerous move, but maybe it could be tested that if they become more transparent with us, if they let us confront those profiles, we might actually correct them. We might maybe give them more trusted data, more quality data. I'm not advocating this as the best solution, but I would be interested to hear feedback from those companies. Would they like it or not? Would they allow us to confront this data double and say, no, I'm actually not this person. Maybe you want to meet the real me. What would happen is, are we getting at this extremely ridiculous situation in which they would say, we don't care. We actually prefer to talk to your data because it's much easier, faster, uh, cheaper, and we can still get the same effect, modify your behavior, right? Like we can talk by talking, by interrogating your data and creating this profile, we might have actually better chance of uh, turning you into this perfect uh, uh, element of surveillance capitalism that we want you to be, rather than by engaging conversation with you. But that could be an interesting experiment, right? Opening that dialogue and hearing this back from, from, from companies. So that's, that's one of the fantasies I, I have, and I'm really curious what you think. And another fantasy that I, I don't have myself, but I took it from Mr. Harari writing uh, about humans and data and being very successful in promoting his narrative. Uh, when I read uh, Homo Deus, I thought, wow, my God, he might be right. Today, uh, I feel uh, that those data doubles, those profiles are against me. It's a dark side of capitalism. It's something scary. It's something we try to uncover. What if people, as he argues, start believing that actually those machines that observe us, those, those machines that interpret our behavior, our bodily behavior, our chemical processes from our brains, could actually solve our problems better than we can solve them, Yes, because if you buy into this logic that we are all algorithmic uh, creatures, our mental and, and physical processes um, behave a bit like algorithms, but we cannot control them, yes, because we are inside. But if there was something, some, uh, something like a device connected to my body all the time that I control, imagine I control it, it's not Google, it's me having server under my desk that collects all this data and tells me, look, I know what you should drink, eat, and do tomorrow. I know who is your best friend because your, reac your reactions are most intense. I know wh which of the guys you are dating should become your husband. I know which politician you really like because you react best to his um, promises and not just last minute change your behavior because somebody told you in the advertising that I'm the cool one. Would that work for people? Because if, if, if that would work, then we are in real trouble because what makes me scared and, and, and anxious, anxious and uh, motivates me to do my work today, thinking about this, those profiles, yes, uh, that could become the promise for people, the, the promise of better life. They would pay for those profiles to be created on them by the devices connected to their bodies and minds if they bought into this, this concept of self-improvement through observation. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the, 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 the dark fantasy that somebody sells us, but I also wonder how it resonates here and how we could, uh, what's the counter, counter narrative really we could bring here, assuming that people would control those devices, they wouldn't be um, controlled by corporations. Thank you very much, uh, Kasia. Um, on, on this last point, I will try to come back. Um, but first of all, thank you, Manuel. And, and again, thank you, Irina, because finally we are bringing to CPDP a debate that is not only people. about uh, data protection and privacy, which are extremely important, uh, we should never forget, but also about the political economies that in which data protection, privacy, and data processing models 
operate and or can operate? What are the condition of possibility or what are the conditions that permit these models to operate? And I think that your presentation and your work is really, really, really healthy for our community. If there is anything like a community around here to, to think about something that we do not see because it's so much what we live every day. Um, as we were mentioning before, like I have some, some slightly different uh, points, but I will try to, to, to go through and, and make some, some provocation. I think that uh, something that you are bringing uh, and you were saying today is uh, we have to think more about what is work and what is a worker. You were, if I understood you correctly, uh, should we escape the condition of being data workers or not? Uh, and, and I have no, 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 no real uh, um, answer to that, but I think it's a definitely a very good question to raise. And, it, it, and I will propose it to, 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 the, to the public to, to, to discuss it further. Um, I'm thinking about uh, recent work about uh, data colonialism, uh, where, where uh, we are both colonizing the data, but also like this kind of data processing um, operation are, are recolonizing us, or are using us as colonial subject, and I think that uh, worker is still better than, than, okay. than a colonial subject. Uh, uh, from my perspective, there was a, like a, a politics of workers, so like a labor movement had been built upon uh, a sort of uh, becoming a worker. So do we really need to, to escape that? Uh, another point I would like to add to the question of labor slash work, um, at Price Camp, uh, we had, uh, uh, for the first time, a delivery rider that was presenting his uh, personal experience with the platform. I really like his conclusion. He was saying something like, we know that uh, this kind of uh, capitalist model of platforms like Deliveroo, but not only Deliverable, do not work in an economic beneficial way for those that are investing on them in the current labor condition. So they presuppose that in very short time frame, the labor condition at the national level will change. So I will invite us to think not only about uh, data workerism, but also what are the implications on other labors that are not really data dense. So what are the, the condition of workers that are not primarily data workers? And this brings me a little bit to, to a, a further provocation about your work. I was thinking like uh, this is the classical post-colonial criticism, I will do it. I'm also paid to do it, so I will do it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that there is something very important that, uh, uh, that uh, I myself should address way more. We can say, finally, those are white men problem, or, or uh, white Western or white um, wealthy Asian problem. Mm -hmm. um, to some extent, if there is something like that, I just make it up a category. Um, and, and because yes, it's, it's like a data worker, so I'm a data worker, we probably playing with our smartphones or, or me in front of the screen, I'm a data worker using Evernote. Um, but, uh, but what about all the other labor that is uh, premised upon it? And I'm thinking about a recent work by um, Kate Crawford and uh, Vladan Yogler about the anatomy of an uh, um, uh, yeah, IE system. And I really like their fact that they are taking seriously also the materiality of the system and where the different pieces uh, are coming from and which kind of labor condition presuppose that. And I think that again, we can escape the sort of white academia. I'm thinking about uh, a writer, a novelist like uh, in college, Jean Bofane, and his latest book about Congo Inc. He is always making this connection between Congo desperate situation when it comes to human rights, to, to violence and war, and the role of a new attach uh, in that, uh, in terms of strictly extraction, not of data, but of raw materials understood old school. Um, maybe a, a last point uh, that touch upon uh, um, the very title uh, of, of this panel, and, and this quantification will tear us apart. Actually, uh, and this may be one way in which I try to solve the problem of, of thinking capitalism or survey or what you call surveillance capitalism um, is that uh, quantification actually has been fundamental in keeping us together. Like historically, qu without quantification, we won't have states. We won't have uh, social categories. Some quantification is different from other forms of quantification. And I'm thinking in particular to the work of Alain de Roisier, and there is a beautiful piece where he tried to retrace different ways of quantifying. 
and not all ways of quantifying tear us apart. Some ways are bringing us together or make the social uh, class to recognize themselves as social classes. And like a welfareism was based on statistics, was based on specific type of quantification. The kind of quantification you are focusing on is a neoliberal, he will call it a neoliberal quantification. But then we, we come to, to, to your point about algorithms. And, and I, here I see a bifurcation. There is the classical neoliberal quantification understood as benchmarking and the fact that uh, if you do not deliver what you say about uh, optimization, so I have to publish more, I have to publish alone, I have to have a better age index uh, to be a successful academic, or I have to, to, to compile enough uh, stuff to do, so to show that I have good stats. But in some environment, uh, this will feedback directly on me, and I really need to make these uh, numbers correct, because they have a direct effect on me as a worker, as an academic, and so on. But in many other aspects of my life, when I'm browsing uh, Facebook and I'm receiving uh, targeted advertising. This targeted advertising does not have to be so targeted. Like there is something that uh, um, uh, GLSP calls the relevance of the algorithm and it's not so important if 90% uh, of this advertising is misplaced because the, the great numbers make it worse even if only 10% or maybe 1% of this advertising follow up. And this comes to the fact that um, I will I, I fully agree. I'm very curious also to know which kind of companies will be really interested to speak with you, Kasha, or with me, Rock, or with you, Manuel, rather than some generic profile that is definitely not our dot double, but something to which we have the contributed. The projection to. they want to push us. To so, become. so for me, this like this also shows limit to some extent to a very representational approach to data protection and privacy, or to the very notion of dot double that I used myself and start to criticize now because uh, show the limits in terms of, of the feedback effect. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a very, just, just a follow up on this, uh, uh, I find it more and more useful argument in uh, fighting surveillance capitalism. People don't care when, when we confront uh, uh, humans in this game, they often say, oh, come on, is it targeted advertising? It's bullshit, it's the same fridge I see one month you know, on, I, I don't care. But then if we change the argument from they know you better than you know yourself, maybe some do, maybe Google, Facebook does, but definitely <laughs> the normal retargeters, data brokers don't. If we change that argument into, hey, imagine you have a ridiculous uh, profile that makes you look ridiculous in the eyes of your bank, employer, recruiter, and nobody will ever care what you think about this. How, how, that, how does that feel? Yes, maybe that controlling argument, the argument of actually us being um, uh, being subjects, not objects here, and uh, wanting to, to come across as ourselves, maybe that's a better argument in the whole privacy debate than the, 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 the argument of they track you better than you could ever imagine. Yeah, Manuel, do you want to react or do we want to start inviting our public to become our speakers or co-speakers? Maybe just very briefly I wanted to say that mm. Mm, indeed quantification in itself, it historically it did not have all the time such a bad uh, connotation as now. Uh, for example, the, the hunter-gatherers were also quantifying, even quantifying before they, they were able to count, but they were able to tell, okay, this size of this tree can produce this amount of apples. So it was driven by the promise of survival. So perhaps the, the problematization of the title of quantification will tear us apart. It emerges from promises of quantification that are imposed by powers of surveillance, of surveillance capitalism, not necessarily by conditions of our human nature in which we try to quantify things to survive. Um, and, and while the, the two of you were talking, you know, I was thinking so much in the, the therapist algorithm and, and how in a way we place a lot of trust in our therapists because we believe that they can know us better than ourselves, right? This is why, why in society these people go to the therapist. Well, if these algorithms are going to know us better than ourselves and they can directly already create products of behavioral modification, perhaps we should be speaking about something new that is the the therapist algorithm 
which is an algorithm that is much more capable than a therapist to understand myself and is actually much more capable of shaping my behavior to change these things that I'm not so, so happy with. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Um, what do you think? Join the con conversation, please. I wish we were <laughs> in a circle, actually. <gasps> Penelope. Um, thank you, Manuel. Uh, I think it's... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for this um, really exciting um, presentation of your work. I didn't know of your of this uh, institute. I really need to go and uh, explore what you're doing there because it looks fascinating. Um, so my PhD was um, about how users understand their relationship with their smartphone devices and uh, more specifically the, the services uh, that they're empowered through the uh, location tracking system. I conducted uh, focus groups uh, and we used uh, video stimuli as um, visual vignettes actually as stimuli for the discussion. And I was thinking uh, that after I will uh, show them a video with um, all these risks of surveillance and surveillance capitalism, uh, I showed them interviews with Edward Snowden. Um, I tried to make it uh, uh, more vivid, and I thought that after that they're all gonna resist and protest and demand their data back, you know. But then it was not like that. And uh, I came up with the uh, conce concept of seductive surveillance. So all these, um, all these technologies that uh, are, are were presented here and we talked about are technologies that we buy for ourselves. And we think that we are in control, as Katrina said, of our data. And that these technologies are gonna make us better. And what was very interesting also in the discussion uh, with uh, young students was that they were like, yeah, but it saves me time. Uh, they will create a product that I never even knew that I need. So they were very bought into this discourse of all these neoliberal discourses we are talking about. So I appreciate the fact that we all uh, theorize and we're trying the best with the uh, European legislation and uh, we're trying to understand how surveillance works and operate exactly in this structural uh, mode that you presented. And I think that this is what individuals, or for most individuals in Western societies, is very difficult to understand. This structure, structural power asymmetry. So my question is how can we um, either make uh, our discussions and privacy sexier, more seductive than the products of surveillance capitalism, or, um, I do, or make uh, actually the users to identify as, cons as consumers, as, as workers, instead of consumers that they identify with uh, today. I mean, I don't, I was just the ideas I was uh, <laughs> thinking about <laughs> while you were all talking. I think that uh, Rene has the answer. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, th thanks. You, thanks. Um, I actually want to go come directly on that, that point. Um, because for me, indeed, the, the gesture of starting to think of the Data Workers Union is the, the most essential part of it is indeed I think that the history, history of seeing yourself as a worker in a structural condition of being under a suppressive power, the point of that, that historical movement is to start the individual to see that he's actually part of a collective and a strong, in the end, a potentially stronger collective. Um, and I don't know if the worker exactly, there are some problematics with using that. And, and our current condition is different than it was in the factories in the beginning in London, in the beginning of, uh, of the, the, the old form of capitalism. But I think that it, that's the search that is going on and, and that, that makes these kind of questions, that's the, the center of these questions. Like what will be a, unify, a, a unifying image or um, imagination that, that will help people understand that they're not just individuals, not just consumers, um, and that 
the effectivity on the individualized level actually destroys some kind of collectivized unity of what it means to be human, because I don't want to say collectivized efficiency because it's actually not efficiency, it's something else that we cannot yet know the name, but we need the name. Um, and as a side note, I, I, I really like the work of uh, Zubov and, and it resonates also in this speak, in this talk and also in the uh, feedback of the panelists, um, especially because she says we need to name our current conditions and only when we find the words, we can start to also find a way to fight it or to change yeah, it. But <laughs> I, I am a bit scared and a bit of a critique that I still want to develop, hopefully together with you and especially together also with Manuel, is she then refers back a lot to effic effective, uh, effective living as a good thing. And I think that is not the right way to go. Effective living, what's that? Effective living. Effe ah, effective, like, uh, the, the, I don't know. She, she, in her work, efficient, efficient effective. Uh -huh. she, the word efficient is a lot present in her work and not as something bad, but as something positive. And I think that is a might be a trap. Hmm. Yeah, maybe to, to, to kind of co combine the, the two responses. Thank you for the, for the two responses. Um, you, you were asking something that I can interpret on the lines of how the privacy discourse can stop surveillance capitalism. I don't think that the discourse on privacy alone um, can really stop this model from happening. I think there are many other things, like, like Claudio here is working in, in, in the control of recommendation algorithms that have implications with privacy, but also with behavior, with identity. Um, all of these products do not control only um, yeah, my privacy or my image, but control public infrastructure control public transport, control many things that escape the realm of the digital, that escape the realm of screens, laptops, and keyboards. Um, I don't think that framing this struggle alone within the domain of privacy, we can build an, an, an effective force <laughs> uh, <laughs> to combat that. We know this by now. <laughs> and, 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 and just to, to maybe elaborate more in this, uh, I will call it a preliminary critique on the age of surveillance um, capitalism of Zubov, that I think most of the book is written from the perspective of someone who implicitly and explicitly sometimes confirms that she believes that we can live with information capitalism. So the book is not really advocating to stop or destroy surveillance capitalism to live in a communist utopia, but rather to go back to the forms of capitalism that we had before, that in my opinion, and I think with some of my colleagues is shared too, it was not at all an ideal form of, of organizing the life of human civilization in this planet. Um, but as I say, it's a preliminary analysis, and, and this effective life that refers to is an abstraction that becomes really vague um, and unclear, though I really appreciate, I find it like a key groundbreaking work in this naming of what it is and, and as economic analysis of what surveillance capitalism is. Claudio. Thank you. The world of panel is fascinating. Um, I was inspired by the layer metaphor um, <laughs> from Kasha on uh, the level of metadata. Uh, that is something that uh, visually can apply to photo, for example. To what? Photo, photos. Pictures. Photos. Uh -huh. The uh -huh. first layer is understanding uh, which is the definition, the model of the machine that uh, make the photo. The second uh, layer is understanding the context, uh, the background, uh, and then uh, maybe face recognition or attribution of value of the cloth uh, you are seeing in the picture. And they try to put a layer of multiple metadata as a metaphor to uh, show how more uh, computing power extract and mine more data. Uh, that is something that uh, should be seen more. It should be nice to see it happen and see how much it is useful to advocate and explain the complexity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ever since I built this metaphor for myself and I started using it, like, I think three months ago, it really helped me get to people from outside of the bubble because in this bubble it's, yeah, it's yeah. simplification. Uh, but for outsiders, it's like, oh, ah, okay, even the portion. Okay, I will try to find this in a minute and show you what, what, what I mean. But uh, looking for better narratives, uh, 
my intelligent guessing, all I can do here, is that we should try to use exactly the same trick uh, as neoliberal, neoliberalism exploited. So if people um, went for leave, like accept the, 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 the fate of being this exploited resource and free labor and all this, just because of the promise of being unique, uh, being consumers, being those who choose, you know, like buy into this, why don't we just expose it and say reality is exactly the opposite and we offer you by our, um, by, by placing you in a position of a worker, by placing you in a position of data subject, by placing you in a position of control, we actually deliver on this promise. Like basic trying to, to, to stay even within the neoliberal narrative, but simply prove that this is a lie, rather than propose the opposite of it, and say, oh, we will not consume, we will, um, we will not work, we will be some, somebody very, very different, right? Uh, yes, the efficiency paradigm is super powerful. I feel I'm, 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 I'm subjected to this myself, and it's my personal struggle to accept that I could be useless and lazy, lazy and nobody would care where I am and what I do. It's hard, psychologically it's hard. It's challenging to accept that you are useless. Nobody needs you, you know? It's, it's, it's a radical thing to ask for. That's why it's so powerful. Uh, but, uh, Kaja, I, to, to keep the provocation going on, uh, f for me, what I see as problematic of that, besides uh, like uh, the uh, tactical element of, of fighting a, um, a rear guard uh, battle or, or being always a second uh, in, in, in the debate, um, is the fact that uh, like uh, we already get into the logic of that whether if you're not efficient, you're lazy. Is that uh, the mm -hmm. contrary of efficiency is not laziness? Is, is a different relation to, to well, or is a different a good thinking, life? Uh, is a different way of having a good life and, and to think what a good life is supposed to mean and to be uh, and to, to make it out. And I think that uh, seduction is like is powerful. I, I'm, I'm seduced. Like I, I, uh, I have to. I will make this official. Like Amazon is my companion in, in doing research. Like I bought a lot mm. of books thanks to Amazon and, and thanks to all of you that were buying books similar to mine, so I also... Thank you for, for, for sharing that. your data but, with us. But, 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 but it was <laughs> isn't important, and, and I like to be seduced. And, and, I, like, and I, f I find that they're just um, criticizing and saying, like, debunking uh, the, the, what is fake is not enough to, 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 to win a political uh, debate. Uh, Julien, meanwhile? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so thank you for this very interesting discussion. I've, fortunately, I didn't know there was a side event, so I nearly arrived towards the end. But so I hope what I'm going to say isn't going to be too much off track. But while yeah, I was... everything. It's a free <laughs> conversation. Okay. But when I, um, I was listening to this discussion and, you know, um, this idea of let's try to find a narrative to debunk the um, seduction of the uh, of surveillance capitalism and so on, I was thinking that... Um, um, perhaps the discussion uh, is often or too often on, um, although it is also relevant, but too often on the idea that people are indeed seduced or are convinced or do buy completely into this narrative and so on, and that if we can debunk it, then people will, I don't know, stop using Facebook, stop using Amazon and so on. But I think that we might also need to look at it from the other way, which is that um, these types of services exist and flourish because they are tools that are serve a purpose in the type of society that we live in, in the sense that, for example, I'm thinking about uh, one thing is uh, the role of surveillance in building trust in our society. We keep saying that we need data protection to enhance trust and so on and so on, and it has been a narrative for like 40 years in data protection. But at the same time, why do you trust the couch surfer who you are, who is coming to your house, because he has a profile and his trustworthiness has been quantified by a crowd of digital laborers. Why do you trust this Airbnb place or this hotel? Why does your banker trust you to pay back uh, the money he lent, you borrowed from him and so on? Um, 
these tools are also used um, because uh, to, uh, to save time or because the time has accelerated in a certain way. Um, you cannot afford to tell, you know, to, to tell your boss, well, if you want me to answer this question, please send a postal letter and then next week you will have the answer because simply then you will not be in the same, in sync with in the same time um, as the others. So basically, uh, yeah, I'm wondering, uh, for example, like these are quite fundamental things and I've been wondering for the past few months or so, uh, like for example with surveillance uh, and trust, like can we create, can we think of a way to create trust in our society that does not rely ultimately on surveillance and quantification, like all of these things, like what is it that we need to change in our society so that people, once we debunk the myth, can actually use something else to fulfill the purpose and to fulfill it without using surveillance capitalist tools. So, yeah, that's just two cents. Madam, please. Okay. Yes, sorry. I'm not at all involved in privacy and, and all these matters. Um, I'm a sociologist, so. But I'm very, very happy to be here, so I learn a lot. <laughs> um, so I think uh, one of the main reasons is uh, together with these changes in wanting to optimal, optimal, uh, optimalize, uh, improve and enhance constantly is the logic of risk. Um, is that we have changed, we have some kind of, it's, it's the urban uh, Ulrich Beck uh, logic, uh, that we have created some society where we want to avoid risks. Um, and that's one of our main um, changes we have had in the thinking. Um, when we then want to, to reduce risks, we, we, want, we are more, let's say, open towards this logic of surveillance, um, which is then combined by fear. So you have the logic of fear and risk, I think, um, if they should change something, that they are the key concepts, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, I, I strongly agree. Thank you for reminding us this, because it's a fundamental condition to which we react by doing what, what you described, by trying to uh, manage those risks and those uncertainties by, by collecting data that give us ratings, that gives us, give us sense of security. Well, personally, I usually challenge myself in that thinking and others mostly by trying to, to, to show that this data does not always give us uh, the best results in terms of managing real problems, yes? Are we really better in managing real problems like crime or financial crisis or theft or uh, discrimination or, you know, the real things that can go wrong? Are, are they really um, more um, avoidable as a result of those risk profiles we created? Uh, do we really behave better towards banks and ourselves? And are we kind, more kind clients? Does it all work better as a result of having data? Or that data only gives us sometimes false sense of security until things go wrong again? Um, while I, I would say that probably personal relationships would be the answer to, to how to avoid ratings based on data. Uh, in those circumstances where you have personal re relationships, but that would force us to move back from global village to village. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not so sure whether we are not doing this anyway, like, you know, whether at some point that's, that will not become necessity anyway, or the most reasonable <laughs> way of dealing with uncertainties and risks, exactly downsizing to relationships that can be managed, that the banker knows you, and those people who know, is, know you, and that's how it works. Uh, that's my fantasy more, I think, more linked to ecological crisis than anything else. Imagining, uh, like, I like that uh, you are speculating on uh, hypothetical systems. Someone more collaborative, uh, cooperative, someone uh, state-led. Uh, uh, the extreme can be, or the current uh, platform uh, monopoly and the co complete hegemony on, uh, on the decision of the policy in the platform. And the other opposite will be the fully peer-to-peer -peer network where uh, you are completely independent, you just connect uh, what, uh, whatever you want, you shape uh, your policy, but you are, uh, let's say, in the anarcho-libertarianism spectrum. Yeah. Uh, do these analogies with the current political system, like uh, currently the algorithm hegemony is uh, North Korea, or what we know about, or what we know, like we, we think we know about North Korea. 
it, using this uh, reference can help us to imagine uh, systems where uh, we can keep our data partially shared among us to survey collaboratively, optimize ourselves until this respect certain policy that are democratically decided and you can implement uh, the policy of uh, your society also in um, some part of the platform and uh, who participate in, the, in this network stay in these uh, rules. But uh, you start from the bottom-up approach in making uh, two people or a bit more larger network until you can participate to multiple network and uh, I want us to, to come back before I get to Claudio um, on, on, on the contributions of the two of you that I found very much related as I felt that this question of trust is very much clearly exemplified how the social credit system in China it aims to be or it's propagandized or it's a promise that is being sold by it and to recover trust in society. It, it's something that is being narrated many times when you actually read sources of the government that it's to reestablish the trust in society. And, and I can also link that to Harari, but the previous book with Sapiens, mm -hmm. and, and he goes to argue that what enabled Homo sapiens to become so efficient in organizing society is not that we were smarter or that we were stronger, but the ability to create fictions. The ability to create fictions that allowed us right. to collaborate with humans that we do not know, with humans that we do not have a rating system form. So, uh, fictions such as religions or states or, or, or communities or, or social constructs that enable me to, to meet the two of you today. We don't know each other, but, but we can trust each other through certain fictions or belief systems that we have that relates to your thought on are we already going back to this smaller village of these maybe 150 people that I don't have to systematically quantify through technology, but I can get to know since we are rejected big fictions like religion, right? So since we don't have the big fictions anymore and... Uh, yeah. But then I was also thinking on, on the question of, of, of risk that you were posing, that uh, Thubo also states in the book that one of the bands that, that enables surveillance capitalism to, to merge as such was 9-11. Since 9-11, the, there was a huge change from the discussion of privacy towards a discussion of security and risk the narrative of fear. So that also enables surveillance capitalism to pass so um, extremely strong for this imaginary of fear that it was created. Also the, the dot com bubble pushed a lot of things and its many factors, but I, I feel that these fictions such as fear, risk, or promises of the good things that uh, Amazon is giving us for our books, or it's, is it maybe a question that we need new narratives? We need new fictions, we need new metaphors. Mm, I don't know. Definitely. We need a panel of super versus Harari uh, next I, week. I, I, I know that uh, Rene has a question. This is going to be the last question because uh, Maybe it's a before, comment that will solve it all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. again, again, again. Uh, and because the cocktail is going to start soon uh, and uh, and I'm Thursday. Um, uh, but, but no, no, I, I like this, but maybe we can keep discussing a little bit, but René. Um, Thank you, yeah, I want to come back to this, uh, this proposition that w was made that okay, we also need the systems because it actually improves the trust in society and how would you have a, I'm not sure if that, but anyway, I wanna, I'm not going to put that on you, but that's how I, uh, anyway, I read it or how it's being read in society. We have, are in this narrative that we need all these forms of quantifications of control in order to create trust. And it's a main line also of, of all of those companies that know we, we provide trust. The reality is that in, at least in the Dutch society of which I know the statistics, crime rate is at like an all time low. Like poverty reduction, the risk, like all kinds of risk are at a really low level. Yet the feeling of risk is at a super high level. And that is that this narrative created it. It's like it's it, but it is a bubble. It, it isn't a. It's an. It's a false narrative, I would say. Mm -hmm. And so, rather than say, uh, then just going with that, we I think need to find. We don't trust data. We have. Uh, we trust the narrative more. Than exactly the data. because mm -hmm. if we would actually use the old form of statistics, and I like that part also of both of your contributions, that okay, no quantification or quantifying doesn't always lead to bad outcome, no, I would indeed say like statistics 
have been an extremely big part in the growth of, uh, uh, of, of good things in our societies. But this kind of quantification and the narrative that is around it is often actually at fundamental odds with another type of quantification and statistics. And we need to be wary about that and we need to flag that when it happens. Yeah. Indeed, I, I will contest uh, this 9-11 narrative about turning point because uh, I think that yeah, it, it, it's, it's very flown from, from a research perspective. Like there are other researchers that are thinking in, in, in the shift between statistics and accounting and the real shift that paved the way to what we can call a neoliberal way to statistics or the neoliberal well, well, way of it, uh, like happened. way before the 70s, yeah. 80s and so on, so way before the 9-11. Um, I, 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 I'll pose it as a question. I really wonder always, like I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert and I would like to, to learn more about, is there a difference between a narrative and fiction? I, I sense that there is. Uh, I'm sure that there are some critical theories that can help us and illuminate us. But I have the feeling that uh, like a, a fiction presupposes some shared rules. Uh, uh, not trust, but shared rules. And, and the fact that we agree on, on, on what is a genre, or what, what can happen in that kind of fiction or what is imaginable to happen in a short fiction, while narrative is a way to, to steer uh, a story in, into a, a specific direction. And, and, and so maybe we can retain, like a uh, um, uh, philosopher Jacques Rancière uh, keep saying that uh, fiction is a moment where politics starts and that uh, the, the, the labor class does not exist is a fiction, but without that fiction, you don't have the labor class and you don't have labor rights and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's an active moment of, uh, of getting into the game and into the fiction and you have to decide. And to do the moving. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm, like, I'm, I'm an academic because I'm a very poor fiction writer. So <laughs> I'm looking at you, Manuel. Do you want to, 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 to give us a fiction, to propose us a fiction? Well, I, I don't know. I think if, if we are having a prolific conversation here that I hope you all share that we do, it's because we are kind of sharing things from different expertise or from different mm -hmm. fields. Um, like a bit of a conclusion you are asking yes. for. Yes. I don't really <laughs> have a conclusion. I hope we can have maybe some more conclusive discussion in the cocktails or something, or we can dance to Iggy Pop and, and Joy Division, perhaps. Um, no, but perhaps so, something that I, it, it came back to me during all of these responses was the question of if an individual becomes, <coughs> through these Snowden revelations, for example, that you were referring to, becomes more aware of these problematics, is perhaps doing something with his or her individual behavior. I might install Signal, I might start using PGP, I will use Tor Browser and so on. That does not change anything of the structural dynamics of surveillance capitalism. It's like me withdrawing to my cave <coughs> so I can protect myself, while majority of the people won't, and the system will just keep growing until a moment in which I won't even be able to hide myself in that cave. So I'm not saying that GDPR is legitimizing surveillance capitalism, please. But please. I think we have to think a bit beyond the question of privacy when it comes to tackle these questions. Um, I, I think it was very interesting to also bring Harari in this kind of conversation as well, that is perhaps not so invested in privacy. But perhaps is, as, as someone says, not a question of technologies or economies, but a societal question. Are we living in societies of the individual or are we living in societies of the collective? And I think if we drive more thoughts towards this social dimension on how to create, use, and evolve with our technologies and to, to perhaps not let surveillance capital dictate and impose what kind of technologies we do, but look at the society that we have, which things do we want to change in that society and which technologies then can help us to achieve that project, perhaps we might be in a better, better equipped position. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to the public. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Irina, again for bringing us together.